Okay, um, uh, today we'll talk about uh, two architects. We'll begin, begin with Etienne uh, Louis Boulet, uh, the great uh, visionary architect of the 18th century, uh, born in 1728 and died in 1799. Uh, an emotionally committed neoclassicist. Somebody used these words, they are not mine, but I am tempted to agree that there is something uh, uh, correct here, but this is more uh, than, than, than just this. So Etienne Louis Boulet, uh, born uh, on, uh, on uh, the 12th of February, so, so this month we'll talk twice about him, but died on the 4th of February, 1799 was a visionary French neoclassical architect whose work greatly influenced contemporary architects. And, uh, you know, contemporary architects that refers to our time. Boulet's fondness for grandiose designs has caused him to be characterized as both a megalomaniac and a visionary. His focus on polarity, offsetting opposite design elements, and the use of light and shadow was highly innovative and continues to influence architects to this day. He was so-called rediscovered in the 20th century and has influenced recent architects, well, when this text was written. Now it's not so recent. Recent architects such as Aldo Rossi. Aldo Rossi died in a car accident. Salon, salon for the Hotel de uh, Tourol. Uh, hotel Alexandre, also known as Hotel Su, is a hotel particularly particular in the in the eighth arrondissement of Paris, France, designed by uh, Etienne Louis Boulet. The building was constructed from 1763 to 1766, and is the best surviving structure designed by Boulet. Not too many things uh, built by him uh, survived. And maybe he didn't even build so much. He is famous for his drawings, for his projects. Uh, this is a, you know, uh, an 18th century, you know, neoclassical hotel. Now, if it is emotionally charged or not, we can talk about it. Uh, it still stands, and you say it's nothing very special about it. Uh, maybe a certain you know, softness of design, but otherwise, yeah, neoclassicism, 18th century, building by uh, Etienne uh, Louis Boulet, uh, rendering from I don't know when, maybe 19th century, maybe 18th. Um, yeah, I prefer his drawings. And you see, it's possible just with three, with, with drawings, with, um, with, um, uh, you know, projects to make it into the glorious history of architecture. 1909 photograph of the building by this famous um, French photographer, Eugène Adjet. Um, here it is, the building by Etienne Louis Boulet. When was it? 1909. That's how it looked like. Now, Cenotaph, this is a very famous work by him, perhaps the most famous, the Cenotaph for Sir Isaac Newton, uh, a project from 1784, and I am sure you know it. But let's read a little bit about it. Boulet promoted the idea of making architecture expressive for its purpose, a doctrine that his detractors termed archit architecture parlant, talking architecture, which was an essential element in Bozar architectural training in the later 19th century. So, uh, talkative architecture, architecture parlant, talking architecture. His style was most notably exemplified in his proposal for a cenotaph, a funerary monument celebrating a figure interred elsewhere for the English scientist Isaac Newton, who 50 years after his death became a symbol of enlightenment ideas. The building itself was a 150 meters tall sphere, taller than the great pyramids of Giza, encompassed by two large barriers circled by hundreds of cypress trees. 
The massive and spheric shape of the building was inspired by Boulez's own study called Theory of Bodies, where he claims that the most beautiful and perfect natural body is the sphere, which is the most preeminent element of the Newtonian Newton Memorial. Though the structure was never built, Boulez had many ink and wash drawings engraved and circulated widely in the professional circles in 1784. The small sarcophag sarcophagus for Newton is placed at the lower pole of the sphere. The design of the memorial is, is intended to create the effect of day and night. The night effect occurs when the sarcophagus is illuminated by the sunlight coming through the holes in the vaulting, giving the illusion of stars in the night sky. So it's interesting, you know, the, um, the, the, the night effect actually happens during the day. The day effect is in an armillary sphere hanging in the center that gives off a mysterious glow. Thus, the use of light in the building's design causes the building's interior to change its appearance. And here it is. You certainly know it. It's a very famous uh, rendering. It's certainly not the most modest building in, envisioned by human beings. But this was the visionary architect Boulet who wanted to celebrate a great human mind, uh, Isaac Newton's, in this way. A, co a, commemora a commemorative architecture. That's what it is. So during the day, it would look like this, and du uh, during the, the night, it would look like this. Can you believe it? Uh, rather interesting. The whole idea and, and the renderings are excellent. But this kind of architecture can only, might, uh, can, can only be produced by, by uh, uh, an architect who understands that he is not uh, just, uh, you know, the slave of a possible uh, client, but uh, a visionary, you know, someone who, who wants to celebrate life, uh, death, uh, eternity, you name it, concerned with the ideas that transcend, you know, the, you know, the, the things that uh, we think uh, life is reduced to or reducible to. The cenotaph for uh, Isaac Newton. Now, this is how we envisioned uh, an interior view of the building when the day was growing towards night, towards the night. And the cypress trees are trees used, used to be used for, um, you know, uh, commemorative um, purposes relating to death. That's why he employed these trees around the building and also on these terraces around the building. Again, uh, not the most uh, modest uh, architectural structure ever conceived by a human being. You see the silhouettes of the humans. I mean, this was supposed to be huge. The cenotaph for Isaac Newton, uh, Etienne Louis Boulet, visionary architect of the 18th century in France. And he is usually um, associated uh, uh, with uh, Claude Nicolas Ledoux, Ledoux and Boulet, both visionary architects. Ledoux built more than Boulet, but uh, it's possible that um, his fame resides, uh, like in the case of Boulet, mainly uh, on the basis of his drawings. And when Louis Kahn was asked to write a foreword to a, a, an album, a book on Le Doux and Boulet, he wrote this beautiful short poem, which is the only, probably the only poem that I know by heart. And I will, uh, if you allow me, I will, I will recite it for you. It's very short and it's not really a poem, but it has the appearance of a poem. The spirit in will to express can make the great sun seem small. The sun is thus the universe. Did we need Bach? Bach is 
thus music is. Did we need le do? Did we need boulet? Le do is, boulet is, thus architecture is. This is how Louis Kahn uh, expressed his, uh, let's say, admiration for le do and boulet. But today we talk only about Boulet. Etienne Louis Boulet. Now I show something else because I like to relate what we call the past to the present. And I discovered this uh, cultural center in Tijuana in Mexico, which was clearly inspired by the, by the work by, uh, by Boulet. And it's actually incred incredible that, you know, Boulet arrived at, at, at inspiring a work in Tijuana, which is, uh, you know, the, uh, the very frontier between the United States and, and, and Mexico. And it's, it's a place of uh, destitution, you know, with uh, alcoholics and prostitutes and, you know, all the misery of human life. But this cultural center in Tijuana seems to contradict all of that. Here it is if you can believe it or not. It was not built in the United States, it was built in Mexico, in Tijuana. So the idealism uh, of, of, of Boulet inspired these architects to build this cultural center in Tijuana. There it is. Uh, during the construction. Uh, let, let me look again at it because it's it's hard to believe that they did this in 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 in, in Tijuana. It's not a cenotaph for uh, you know Newton. It's it's it, 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 it's just the 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 form that that inspired these architects and they built it in this uh, uh, in this uh, you know place which had a very different kind of reputation certainly not related to, you know, high culture. I'm going to show later a library built by MVRDV in China, also inspired by Boulet. So again, in my opinion, a relevant, uh, important so-called past doesn't pass. That's why I show, you know, the consequences of these works in the present. Uh, here we have uh, McDonald, the great uh, cultural, of course, I'm sarcastic, cultural export of the United States. And here we have the French cultural export of Boulet to the same place, Tijuana, the frontier between Mexico and uh, the United States. So maybe I don't, I, it, there is no need to, to repeat. This is not done by Boulet, but it was inspired by Boulet for a different purpose. Now, the second uh, project by Boulet for the library of, of, the, of the king from 1785. A uh, huge, a uh, huge uh, metaphor for uh, the vastness of of, of culture, <clears throat> or you know, the vastness of uh, of knowledge transmitted through books. Bibliothèque nationale, Etienne Louis Boulet, unveiled design in 1785, Paris, France. Again, not the most modest library in the world, that's for sure. But here he tried to evoke the, the power, the relevance of what uh, knowledge should have. If it was built, I imagine it would have been indeed very impressive. 
I mean, it is impressive in renderings as well. And there is a, there is a complex symbolism here. I, I think I have some slides, some, some pictures with, uh, I didn't study them, but um, um, it was a complex project. I discovered on a website uh, all kinds of um, uh, references here. We see Atlas, and I'm not sure, I guess this is the entrance, but why is this circle here? Uh, I guess, you know, it, it could be imagined that the entrance into the big, into the actual library might have something to do with, uh, or maybe there is outside uh, a statue, or he proposed a statue of Atlas outside of the library. I don't know. Uh, let's see here. Boulez, unbuilt place de la Place de la Bibliothèque du Roi à la Rue Colbert. So I guess he he proposed it for a specific place in, in Paris. Uh, it was not built. Um, One hundred twenty well centimeters. It cannot be. This is the drawing, of course. Not the actual. Um, now, why is the school of uh, Athens uh, by Raphael here shown? I guess in order to show the what animated the boule, you know, the the, the ideal of the school of Athens, um, you know, uh, actualized in Paris uh, in the 18th century. He imagined, uh, you know, the quest for knowledge to be kind of similar in the painting by Raphael and in the building by proposed by Boulet. A dreamer, of course. But we need dreamers, I think. We need dreamers as well. And the best of them are those who are dreamers, but also capable of assuming reality in its uh, sometimes less uh, dreamy ways. Oh, I don't know. This is, uh, I mean, yeah, it's a section through the building. Uh, it, it looks like almost like a little house, you know, with a sloping roof, but it's actually huge. You saw a perspective or drawing of the, of the main room. Now, by the way of this, I thought of, because it was inspired by Boulet, this... Uh, and Jin Binhai Library in China by NVRDV. You probably know it. It was publicized, uh, uh, you know, copiously. And, uh, you know, uh, like the work in Tijuana in Mexico, this one also shows that the incredible impact that uh, Etienne Louis Boulet had on architecture, mainly through drawings, not through built works. But even MVRDV found, uh, you know, an explicit uh, influence coming from Boulet uh, when they built this library. And the idea to, I mean, you know, there are many non-functional things here, like, you know, here there are books everywhere, you know, uh, which, which you cannot access. Most of the books in this library you cannot access. You can only access you know, to, to this level, and uh, that's it, nothing above. So it's the return of the book to the wall, which I find very, uh, you know, uh, interesting, because as Victor Hugo said, after Gutenberg, the, the book killed the cathedral, because the knowledge that was... Um, uh, present in the stained glass windows and the walls of the of the cathedral, the biblical knowledge, uh, slowly or maybe not so slowly, slowly uh, found place in the pages of printed books. So in this way, the the book killed the cathedral. That's what um, Victor Hugo said. And now the internet, the web, they kill the book, or the book wants to return to the world. In a way, the book, the knowledge of the book, the pages of the book want to return to uh, constitute walls. That is, you know, metaphorically, symbolically, the cathedral. It's, it's, it's an interesting process.
so you know i keep telling these the students the those few students who want to uh, you know reflect on this even if you only leave behind yourself drawings if they have something important to say you could say that uh, you participated to the discourse of architecture and about architecture significantly and you are part of what architecture is just as B boulet was through his um, uh, projects uh, again how do you access these books <laughs> they are not meant to be accessed they just uh, you know, populate the walls and the ceiling uh, with uh, with knowledge. If by books we mean knowledge, as we should. So obviously, this is not a functionalist building at all. The problem with functionalism is that it forgot completely other meanings of architecture and other ways of, 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 of buildings, uh, of, of, uh, other ways of, of, of doing architecture and other ways in which buildings could manifest themselves symbolic, you know, on a symbolic level, a metaphorical level, uh, inspirational level, and so on. To reduce architecture to functionalism is to kill it. Because there are the functions of human life which should be addressed. So this is in China by MVRDV. Clearly influenced by Boulet. Now other bro projects and drawings by Boulet. We are approaching the end of this short presentation. All of them quite immodest. And all of them so-called flirting with death. I mean, really, these are all, you know, funerary monuments. They are all concerned with the afterlife and with commemoration. In a, in a clearly, uh, you know, uh, as um, Guillaume Apollinaire would say, um, uh, you know, useless way, because Apollinaire, the French poet who was a friend of the best painters uh, of, of modernity in France. He he said uh, best architecture is 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 uh, almost always useless. He said uh, a pyramid in order to build a tomb or a grave, to make a, a grave or a tomb, you did you don't need to make all that huge uh, pyramid. La Fel, uh, the same here. You know, so most of this is actually useless if by usage we understand, uh, you know, economy of means uh, serving, a, you know, a clearly defined purpose. Here we have, it's the metaphorical, the symbolic meaning that gives shape to the building as Boulet envisioned it. Or here, look, you know, in, in essence, is is death is informing uh, Etienne Louis Boulet more than life because it's about the eternal but as Charles Baudelaire said the, the, the formidable uh, poet of modernity in the 19th century he said art has two halves one half speaks about the eternal the immutable the permanent and the other half uh, speaks about the transitory the ephemeral the um, uh, circumstantial and art indeed needs both halves now the, here we see more an, uh, an attempt to connect with the eternal and the immutable I mean he had indeed grandiose visions uh, very much so Not even a king could have built something like this or something like this or something like this. Not even a pharaoh, forget about the king, maybe.
Etienne Louis Boulet, theoretician of revolutionary architecture, together with Claude Nicolas Ledoux. His library, the second project. Now look here, and uh, this is the plan. I forgot for what function. It's, it's, it's incredible. I mean, it, it, it's huge. I regret I don't have here. I, I forgot what it was meant for. He did all kinds of such drawings for, uh, you know, utopian purposes or commemorating uh, death. Etienne Louis Boulet, 1728-1799. So he died at uh, 71 years old. He was when he died. The the human beings, the human silhouettes are by new school, you know, like like, like insects. You know, and look here, you know, these are supposed to be human beings. Uh, you know. <laughs> Project for an opera house, 1781, architecture drawing, 1781, an opera house. This is an opera house for the gods, not for human beings. Maybe for, 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 the, for the parents of the gods, for the gods of the gods, or the gods of the gods of the gods. I mean, for the ultimate realities, it's huge. But he was indeed what we might call a visionary architect. Although we use the words visionary usually when we don't comprehend the work of someone and then we call that someone visionary. It's not necessarily a compliment. It's more like a, an expression of... Uh, of a misunderstanding or lack of an understanding. A plan for a museum, Etienne Louis Boulet. The Museum of Museums or the Museum of Museums of Museums. And what is this? God, my God, a vertical building all of a sudden. This is how he occupied his days with uh, with uh, envisioning such uh, uh, immodest structures. 